On the broadcast tonight, local community members have begun planting trees in the Shippensburg area. And a recap of the annual wellness fair. All of that and more right now on SUTV News. Thanks for joining us on SUTV News. I'm Bailey Casada, And I'm Haley Galaskis. Finals week is fast approaching and the Wellness Fair came to town to help students struggling with their well-being. SUTV's Adam Beam has a look at some of the self-care offered to students at the event. As the semester draws closer to the end, the biggest concern for many students is their well-being and mental health. So events like the annual Wellness Fair are a great way for students to practice some good old-fashioned self-care. Wellness is about overall health. It's not just your physical health, it's your mental, um, your spiritual, your um, physical health, just all combined. Um, so it's important for students to explore all those areas and that's what the Wellness Fair offers. The event brought out campus resources like the Page Center and Counseling Center, as well as local establishments like Planet Fitness. Here's some of what they had to offer. Today we're this particular table, we're checking cholesterol, we're doing finger sticks, we get results back in a couple of minutes, we can answer any questions. So this is grip strength over here, hopefully I uh, don't embarrass myself on air, but we're going we're gonna to find out here quick. And squeeze, as hard as you can, squeeze, 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 squeeze. I'm trying, I'm trying. Alright, release. 121, which he was? 100. A little under the mean. Under. Below average. <laughs> we just uh, go to nursing homes, schools. Uh, we do a, a REITs program that the kids have a hard time uh, pronouncing words um, or have a hard time reading with confidence. Uh, they just read out loud and to the dogs. The dogs don't make fun of them. So it's uh, a good program to build confidence in the kids' reading. Students also had chances to win door prizes, receive some free massages and acupuncture, but easily the favorite of the event was all the four-legged therapy friends who came to cheer us all up. Well, clearly this close to finals week is more important than ever to focus on your mental health. For SUTV News, I'm Adam Beam. This is my buddy Reese here. Back to you all at the desk. If you were unable to attend the Wellness Fair, the Counseling Center and Etter Health Center is open from 8 to 4 p.m. every Monday through Friday for the remainder of the semester. A former quarry in Shippensburg will be getting a much-needed makeover. Carson Devitt had the opportunity to check it out for us. In a bid to bring much-needed greenery to the environment and Shippensburg community, a 15-year project will begin this Friday and Saturday. Volunteers will begin planting over 14,000 trees at a pair of quarries located at Furnace Run Park in Shippensburg. Southampton Township bought the land with the state grant after previous owners stopped its two quarry productions. Other than the purchasing of the land, this project will cost the township virtually nothing. The reforestation project will consist of a large variety of trees from American chestnuts to maple trees as well as shrubs that are all native to Pennsylvania. Planning at both quarries will take about 15 years to complete. This project will be successful in restoring wetlands, creating wildlife habitat, and restoring streams. That's all I have for you today with SUTV News. I'm Carson Devitt. The Coy Public Library Food Pantry is set to be fully restocked next week. The Young Democratic Socialist of America campus group have rescheduled their monthly grocery store run from last night to next Wednesday, their last of the semester. The run will occur at 5.30 p.m. with the group meeting at Cub Room 105. Everybody is still encouraged to visit the library's food pantry and help contribute to it. The pantry is open during regular library hours. Do you know anyone graduating college this semester? On Friday, May 5th, graduate commencement will be taking place in the Lores Performing Arts Center. The ceremony will feature Debbie Urso as its commencement speaker. Urso, who is an instructional specialist for the Chambersburg Area School District, graduated from Shippensburg University with a Bachelor in Science in Elementary Education. She also achieved a Master's in Reading from Shippensburg University. On May 6th, the undergraduate commencement will take place. This ceremony will feature alumnus Amy R. Scriginoli. 
Scriganoli is the president and CEO of Belco Community Credit Union. The union is a nonprofit with a current membership of 74,000. The May 6 graduation ceremony will take place in Seth Grove Stadium. For more information on the 2023 commencement ceremonies at Shippensburg University, visit www.ship.edu slash events slash commencement. For many Cumberland County residents, Sunday was a sad day as we said goodbye to the AMC Classic in Chambersburg. SUTV's Adam Beam got to check out the theaters one last time before their final showtimes. Adam? The mall around it has seen foot traffic dwindle over the years. The AMC Theater has been a constant for moviegoers young and old in the Cumberland County area. Unfortunately, the theater is closing its doors after nearly 40 years. When the Chambersburg Mall opened in 1982, it was a popular shopping location as well as hangout spot for the Cumberland County area. The movie theater started showtimes in 1984. Current assistant manager Joel Streit has been working for the theater before it was an AMC. When he first started, it was known as the Carmike Cinemas. Uh, of course, before it was a Carmike Cinemas, it was opened in 84 as a Manos Theaters. It became Carmike, then later became AMC. He showed us around the projection booth, antiques, and even filled us in on some of the theater's iconic moments. So Kevin Bacon visited this mall, and when Kevin came in, supposedly to buy a pair of jeans he needed, because he had relatives in Carlisle, just north of us, and asked why Tremors wasn't playing. We may have had it at another theater in town, um, but we just didn't book it, and that kind of, you know, was just fine up. He had stopped by and we disappointed him by not having his summer blockbuster movie because Kevin Bacon was pretty big by that time in 1990. AMC bought the theater in 2017 and despite making it through the pandemic, the theater chain still had its struggles. Now with blockbusters like the Super Mario Brothers movie and Dungeons and Dragons Honor Amongst Thieves, the Chambersburg AMC will take a bow after all showings have ended on Sunday, April 16th. However, Stripe remains hopeful a new theater will make its way to the county. Um, now it's, it's a lot of memories here We've, from emergencies and incidences and, and parties and just mall events. It's been pivotal to, to the town here and to not have a theater is just a crime. Currently, as it stands, theater owners have not yet indicated whether or not they plan on relocating the theater at this time. So for avid moviegoers like myself, the nearest theaters now for anyone in the Shippensburg or Chambersburg area are going to be in Carlisle or in Gettysburg. For SUTV News, I'm Adam Beam. When we come back, we have an update on the multiple shootings that occurred over the weekend. And we have the details on the leaked Pentagon documents and Air National Guardsmen who leaked them. We have more news coming up. Are you having Three cases of mistaken addresses and the wrong vehicle resulted in shootings this past week, one of which was fatal. Here's Maxwell Brizzy with the details. Three states, three mix-ups, four people shot, one fatal. The first victim is 16-year-old Ralph Yarrell of Kansas City, Missouri. The incident with Yarrell occurred on April 13th when he mistakenly knocked at the wrong house door, believing it to be his siblings. Yarrell was shot twice by 84-year-old Andrew Daniel Lester, who says he thought Yarrell was trying to break in. He's going to forever have a scar on his head that's going to remind him that I was shot because of the color of my skin. A series of protests emerged, demanding justice for Yarrell and his family. A GoFundMe for Yarrell was set up, raising over $3 million. He is currently recovering from his wounds. President Biden has spoken with the Oral family and plans to invite them to the White House once Ralph has recovered. Andrew Daniel Lester can face lifetime imprisonment if convicted. The second victim was 20-year-old Kaylin Gillis, who was fatally shot in Hebron, New York on Sunday after her friend pulled into the wrong driveway. The shooter is 65-year-old Kevin Monahan, who fired at the passenger seat, hitting Gillis twice. The Washington County Sheriff said first responders administered CPR, but Gillis was pronounced dead at the scene. Monahan says he felt threatened by the car's presence and has reportedly shown no remorse for the shooting. The sheriff said no one is believed to have exited the car, and there was no interaction between Monahan and anyone in it before shots were fired. So there's absolutely no reason for, for this man to come out on the deck and, and, and shoot at uh, the vehicle, uh, especially when they're leaving. 
Monaghan has been charged with second-degree murder. And this Tuesday, yet another incident occurred in Elgin, Texas, where two teenage Woodlands elite cheerleaders, Heather Roth and Peyton Washington, were shot after reportedly entering the wrong car in a grocery store parking lot. They were shot by the car's owner, 25-year-old Pedro Rodriguez Jr. The two cheerleaders were treated for their wounds. Rodriguez Jr. has been arrested and charged with deadly conduct. All three cases have led to calls for changes to stand-your-ground laws in the U.S. For SUTV News, I'm Max Wolberzee. And just yesterday, a six-year-old girl and her parents were shot by their neighbor in Charlotte, North Carolina. The suspected shooter is 24-year-old Robert Lewis Singletary, who is currently at large. The incident allegedly erupted after the girl's basketball rolled into, into Singletary's backyard. The girl was shot in the cheek and her father in the back. Her mother was grazed in the elbow. A National Guardsman in Massachusetts will be charged for leaking Pentagon, doc Pentagon documents online. 21-year-old Jack Teixeira was arrested last week regarding the leakage of documents from the Central Intelligence Agency. These documents were said to contain information about the war between Russia and Ukraine. Other documents that were leaked contained information about the weapon programs in China. It should be noted that Teixeira's trial has been delayed. This comes at the request of both the prosecution and defense. They say defense attorneys need more time to prepare. Teixeira will remain in Massachusetts prison until a hearing date is confirmed. Another mass shooting occurred last Saturday at a Sweet 16 birthday party in Dadeville, Alabama. Four people are confirmed dead and 32 are injured. The victims were 17-year-old Shankivia Smith, 19-year-old Marcia Collins, 23-year-old Corbin Holston, and 18-year-old Philstavius Dowdle. Three suspects, including two teenage brothers, have since been arrested for the shooting. Details such as the weapons that were used and possible motivations are being withheld by the police, and the case is still ongoing. This has been the latest in a series of mass shootings that have occurred in the U.S. over the past several weeks, leaving families devastated and communities outraged over the lack of gun reform. Better news out of Baltimore, where a wall enforcing segregation has been demolished after 80 years. Here's Max Brezzi again with the story. Morgan State University in Baltimore has torn down a wall built to segregate after 80 years. The red brick wall, often called a spite wall, was constructed in the late 1930s by white city residents fearful of students from the historically black university. The wall denied students access to the majority white neighborhood and shopping center for decades. Despite many knowing of its origins, the wall remained up for over 80 years. It was finally demolished last Tuesday. The university intends to expand its campus over what was formerly the wall. For SUTV News, I'm Maxwell Brzee. Coming up in World News, we have details on the hospital fire that killed 29 people in Beijing. And almost a dozen migrant fishermen were rescued off the coast of Australia. Stick around after this. What's going on in the slate this week? Haytham Zayami has your slate preview. What's going on this week in the slate? The new section will be covering the SGA election results and the retirement of Dr. Grove and Police Chief Lee. Our opinion section will have a slate speaks on what can be different next year and a piece titled Dear Residents. Our ship life section will include a column on college life abroad along with the solely but shyly column titled Semester Ending Wa. The arts and entertainment section will have a spotlight on senior art along with a summer movie preview. The sports section will feature recaps of the Raiders matches including lacrosse, baseball, and softball. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Ship you Slate. Make sure to pick up this week's edition of The Slate Tuesday at newsstands or read online at theslateonline.com. Now back to Haley and Bailey at the desk. A Wall Street Journal reporter has been detained in Russia on espionage charges. SUTV's Paige Shope tells us the latest for this week's world news. Paige? Tuesday's fire at a Beijing hospital has claimed at least 29 lives. Fire investigators blame the fire on a spark that ignited combustible paint in an area undergoing renovation. Fire officials say all but three of the victims were patients. Christy Lou Stout has more on the devastating blaze. 
the charred aftermath of one of the deadliest blazes in Beijing in recent years. Dozens of people have died after a fire erupted at the Changfeng Hospital. According to state media, the fire broke out at around 1 p.m. on Tuesday and was extinguished about half an hour later. 71 patients were evacuated. At a press event on Wednesday, a Beijing official said the fire was caused by sparks generated during construction work which ignited combustible paint on site. In this amateur video, one person is seen exiting the hospital through a window using a bed sheet. The person climbs down and lands on a roof-like structure and then scrambles across the rooftop to the next building. Later on in the clip, others are seen attempting to escape, balancing on air conditioning units outside, waiting to be rescued. CNN does not know whether they made it to safety. The hospital fire surpasses the toll from a fire in the Daxing district of Beijing in 2017 that killed 19 people in a cramped building for migrant workers. That tragedy prompted authorities to demolish illegal apartment blocks. In the wake of the latest fire, Beijing's Communist Party secretary said, the fire is heartbreaking and the lesson is extremely profound. It sounded the alarm for us, reminding us that the string of safe production cannot be loosened even for a moment. Official Chinese media did not report on the fire until many hours after it was extinguished, prompting criticism on social media. One Weibo user writes, the incident happened after 12 p.m. and not a single media outlet reported on the breaking news at the time. Nearly 10 hours later, after 9 p.m., they started to release standardized press releases. The media has now basically become copy machines for standardized press releases. Hospital fires are rare in China. And after the tragedy in Beijing, 12 people have been detained on suspicion of gross negligence. Christy Lu Stout, CNN, Hong Kong. Eleven Indonesian fishermen were rescued from a tiny island off Australia's west coast on Monday. That's according to a statement from the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, who shared this footage of their teams on site. The fishermen had no food or water for six days after two of their fishing boats were destroyed by Tropical Storm Isla, which hit the region last week. One survivor reportedly even spent 30 hours in the water before reaching the tiny island known as Bedwell. Authorities said eight other people from one of the vessels are still missing. Students at the University of Khartoum recorded the moment when fellow students were evacuated with the help of the Sudanese Armed Forces on Tuesday afternoon. About 100 students were trapped at the university for four days because of fierce fighting between the Sudanese Armed Forces and the Rapid Support Forces that erupted over the weekend. Clashes have re-erupted between the Sudanese Armed Forces and the Rapid Support Forces in central Khartoum the capital of Sudan, just hours after both rival factions agreed on a 24-hour truce, which went into effect at 6 p.m. local time, according to witnesses who told CNN on Tuesday night. Witnesses also said they heard sounds of explosions around the Army General Command Building and the Presidential Palace in Khartoum. Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gerskovich will remain in a Russian jail, at least for now. The U.S. citizen appeared in a Moscow court on Tuesday to appeal the terms of his detention and ask for pre-trial house arrest, but the court denied his request. Gershkovich faces up to 20 years in prison. He was detained in Russia last month on espionage charges and a sign of the Kremlin's crackdown on foreign media news outlets since it invaded Ukraine last year. The Wall Street Journal has vehemently denied the spying accusations against Gershkovich. The U.S. State Department has officially designated him as wrongfully detained in Russia. Gershkovich's legal team said it offered $613,000 in bail, but the court denied bail. They said they will keep appealing his detention. That's it for this week's World News. I'm Paige Shope. Now back to Haley and Bailey at the desk. When we come back in entertainment, we have the latest dating and breakup rumors in Hollywood. We have more after the break. Are you? Season three of The Mandalorian just wrapped up on Disney Plus. 
Here with a review of the new season is SUTV's Adam Beam. Season 2 of The Mandalorian was the season that revitalized my love for the Star Wars franchise. After being burned by the rise of Skywalker, Season 2 really reminded me why I enjoyed this series so much to begin with. And sure, Book of Boba Fett wasn't great, but I was still optimistic that Mando would keep me completely engaged. Unfortunately, I think this season might be their weakest. So when I say this is the weakest season, I don't even want to say that it was a bad season. There were still plenty of great moments, and towards the end things start to pick up, but there are a lot of issues that weigh down the season overall. The biggest is the story. Previous seasons have been structured similarly with more standalone adventures with hints of a larger story, but this season really enjoys drip feeding the story for us. It takes way too long for the main story of the season to kick in, and most of the time the movement of the plot lines is relegated to the final few minutes of each episode, which again wouldn't bother me that much if the individual stories were that interesting. But apart from episodes 2, 5, 7, and the finale, the rest is just really underwhelming. The season also is definitely suffering from the Marvel effect, as much of the season is dedicated to doing the legwork for other series and even movies that have already come out. I'm sure once it all comes together we'll feel different, but like Book of Boba Fett, it feels weird to waste a whole season of a series just to set up three other unrelated things. I still think there's enough highlights from this season of The Mandalorian to warrant a viewing, but I also feel that this season desperately needed a cleaner vision and focus on one one self-contained plot rather than building towards one that will get resolved a few years down the line. The action is solid and the cast is still excellent as ever, but the lack of focus undermines a lot of things that made this show so great to begin with. For SGTV Entertainment, I'm Adam Beam. This is the way. From Taylor Swift's most recent falling out to an unlikely romance, celebrity drama has been making our heads spin. Let's hand it over to SUTV's Maddie Shively, who has what you need to know about Hollywood's relationship happenings. To the dismay of Swifties everywhere, this love story has come to a close. Taylor Swift and boyfriend Joe Alwyn have confirmed their split. After being together for six years, the two have called it quits after privately dating since 2016. Fans have speculated that Swift's last five albums were written about her romance with Alwyn. Several reputable sources, including Entertainment Times, CNN, and People Magazine have confirmed the split. Swift seemingly confirmed she was all right after returning to the stage for her Eras Tour show in Tampa, giving a thumbs up to a fan sign that read, you okay? In a surprising twist, things have been heating up between Kylie Jenner and Timothy Chalamet. Despite being an unlikely pair, sources have confirmed to People Magazine that the two hang out every week, but their relationship is, quote, not serious. Prior to this, Jenner was linked to rapper Travis Scott, while Chalamet has been linked to stars such as Lily Rose Depp and Aiza Gonzalez. 19-year-old Stranger Things star Millie Bobby Brown announced her engagement to John Bon Jovi's 20-year-old son, Jake Bon Jovi. The two have been together since dating rumors had sparked in 2021. The star confirmed the engagement through an Instagram post last Tuesday, arm in arm with her man as she rocked a large diamond ring. The comment section was filled with well wishes from friends and celebs, with the star seeming happier than ever as she gears up for the fifth and final season of Stranger Things. That's all I have for you this week. I'm Maddie Shively for SUTV Entertainment with your Hollywood Relationship Roundup. Broadway's longest running show closed its doors on Sunday. Here with a look back at its legacy is SUTV's Adam Beam. If any show is synonymous with Broadway, it's without a doubt Andrew Lloyd Webber's hit sensation, The Phantom of the Opera. But on Sunday, the chandelier dropped for the last time. The show originally opened in 1986 on London's West End, before making its Broadway debut in 1988, led by Michael Crawford and Sarah Brightman. The show was a resounding critical and financial hit. It swept the award season, earning 10 Tony nominations, winning eight of them, including Best Musical. 
The show celebrated its 10,000th performance in 2012, and to this day, it remains the longest-running Broadway show in history, just above musicals like Chicago and The Lion King. Despite the cultural phenomenon the show had become, it shocked millions in the theater community when the show announced its closing in September of 2022. The show had apparently struggled to recover after the COVID-19 shutdown. The original closing date was set for February 18th, however, the news of the show's closing caused a massive spike in ticket sales, so much so that producer Cameron McIntosh extended the show's run to April 16th. New York Mayor Eric Adams honored Weber with the key to the city and spoke on the show's impact to the city's economy. Uh, to Broadway's, and he keeps the lights on in our hearts as we keep the lights on in Broadway. Broadway is just really thriving. It's an economic uh, boom for our city. When you look at the number of dollars that Phantom of the Opera uh, brought to the city as part of our economy and the vibrancy of what's great about this city. It was an emotional final performance for the cast, crew, and audience in the Majestic Theater. When the Saturday night performance had ended, the crowd refused to leave and the Phantom crew obliged with one last song. Now, for the first time in 35 years, the Majestic Theater is empty, but Phantom will always live on. For SUTV Entertainment, I'm Adam Bean. Speaking of Broadway, we have our very first look at Ariana Grande and Cynthia Erivo in the film adaption of Wicked. While the images don't give us the clearest glimpses at our leads, fans have speculated that these shots come from the film's big finale and original Act One closer, Defying Gravity. There have also been leaked set photos and videos that give us a taste of Grande's Glinda, where we can hear her singing the show's opening number, No One Mourns the Wicked. The film is still in the early stages of production, but the director, John M. Chu, promises more sneak peeks to come. The film is based on the hit musical of the same name and will also feature recent Oscar winner Michelle Yeoh, SNL cast member Bowen Yang, Jeff Goldblum, and original Glinda, Kristen Chenoweth. Wicked Part 1 and Wicked Part 2 will hit theaters on Christmas Day in 2024 and 2025, respectively. That is it for this week's entertainment. I'm Priscilla Schultz, and now back to Haley and Bailey at the desk. When we come back in sports, we have a recap of the Masters. And we take a look at the NBA playoff games. Stay tuned. The Shippensburg University men's and women's outdoor track field teams competed on the home track at Seth Grove Stadium on Wednesday. For the women, leading the way was Sarah McKean, who became the third woman in school history to escape the 20-foot mark in the long jump. McKean also ran a personal record of 12.38 seconds, the 100-meter dash, that moves her into the top 10 of the conference rankings. For the men's team, Pat Maloney won the shot and a discus. He narrowly missed his new personal best in the shot by just two inches on another excellent putt of 56 feet, five and one fourth inches. Through the discus, 163 feet, and took second in the hammer on a throw of 182 feet, 11 inches. The Shippensburg Outdoor Track and Field Team turned next Saturday to host the Paul Kaiser Classic. The grandest golf tournament of the year had the fans in awe once again. Here with the recap of the Masters is SUTV's Jeremy Perna. The 87th running of the Masters Tournament occurred Easter weekend at Augusta National. This match had many storylines, including the harsh conditions affecting play and a surprising withdrawal. A surprising element of the Masters Tournament was the weather, causing the second and the third rounds to be postponed. As a result of the strong gusts of wind and rain, a large tree fell onto the course, resulting in multiple delays in clearing the debris. There were zero injuries reported following the incident. An aching Tiger Woods made the cut and finished off a solid first and second round, but ultimately decided to withdraw due to a lingering foot injury. Brooks Kepka led most of the first three rounds until a late push by John Rahm put him in the lead in Sunday's final round. Rahm would become the fourth Spaniard to win the Masters Tournament, finishing with a solid 12 under par. Phil Mickelson's comeback fell just short as he finished in second place, tying with Brooks Kepka as they both finished eight under par. 
Rahm continues his solid PGA Tour career with a second major title win in three years, the last coming at the 2021 U.S. Open. This is Jeremy Perna from SUTV News. The first round of the NBA playoff has tipped off. SUTV's Jack Ansley recaps the action. The first round of the NBA playoffs have tipped off, and the three-seeded Philadelphia 76ers look to grab a 2-0 lead in their first round series against the middle of the first quarter. Nets up by three. Spencer Dinwiddie hits a three from to put the Nets up 15 to nine. Towards the end of the first quarter, Nets hit another three to tie the game up at 25. Final minute of the first half, Harden finds Maxi his long three. It's good. Sixers chipping away at the lead. On the second half, Sixers down by two, and B drives, puts it up and in to tie the game at 51. From there, the Sixers gain control of this game with a three from Tobias Harris. Under two minutes left, Maxi hits a dagger three, and the Sixers take game two, 96 to 84. On to the late game Tuesday night between the Golden State Warriors and the Sacramento Kings. In the second quarter, tied at 27, Malik Monk with the slit. With the spin and the jumper, he got it to give the Kings a three-point lead. Under a minute to go in the half, Kings up by two. Mitchell with the pickpocket up to Barnes, and he slams it down to extend the Kings' lead. On the fourth quarter, Kings up by four. Monk puts one up and misses. But Draymond Green and DeMontez Zabonis get tied up here, and you'll see this. Green stomped on Zabonis' chest. There's the stomp right there. Here's another look at it. Green was ejected and suspended one game for this altercation. After the, the ejection, the Kings found their offense and went on to win this game, 96-84. For SUTV Sports, I'm Jack Ainsley. Game 3 of the Sixers and Nets series tip off at 7.30 on TNT. That's it for sports this week. I'm Alexander Haig. Now back to Haley and Bailey at the desk. When we come back, a delivery driver in PA is being recognized as a hero. Stay tuned. A pizza delivery driver in Pennsylvania delivered more than a pie recently. He's getting the hero treatment for what he did to a suspect fleeing from police. CNN's Gene Moose shows us how he put his best foot forward. Imagine answering your door. That's a high speed chase. And getting a police chase with your pizza. Oh my God, Jagger! Oh my God, Jagger! But it's what the pizza delivery guy did that inspired awe, and he didn't even drop the pizza. Brookhaven, Pennsylvania police oh. were chasing a suspected oh. stolen vehicle when it went out of control. The pizza delivery guy took control by tripping one of two fleeing suspects, a 17-year-old juvenile. Tyler Morrell from Coco's Pizza decided to put his foot down. I, like, I can't do anything with my hands because I'm holding the pizza, so I just stuck my leg out. Tyler got a bruise out of it, but he's been peppered, make that pepperoni with praise. I deliver pizza and bad guys. Yeah, I'm pretty sick of seeing like crime like that go on. I was just ready to step up and if they needed a hand, I was, I was there or a foot, whatever. <laughs> the suspect got the Karate Kid treatment. Sweep the leg, no mercy. This wasn't the first time bystanders have given cops a leg up. God, God. A veteran with a bad back and a cane casually tripped an armed suspect being chased by police in Ohio. My leg made the choice for me. Brookhaven police thank the pizza guy. If you're interested in a job, we're always looking for good people. Those who ordered the pizza gave a rave review. 10 out of 10 delivery. Tyler didn't just deliver takeout pizza, he delivered a takeout. Genie Mose, CNN. New York. I'm Bailey Casada. And I'm Haley Galaskis. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at SUTV News. And check out our website, SUTVNews.org. We'll see you next week. Good night.